I'm hanging up the phone now. Okay. Hello, my name is Dr. Richard Myron, and I'm very happy to announce our new online PureF course. Because many people have been coming to the courses and wanted an online platform, I'm very happy to offer this new convenient way to learn. It's going to be a nine module program uh, for eight CE credits, and it'll cover biology of wound healing first in module one. We'll cover differences between PRP and all the advancements to BioPureF. Uh, in the later stages, we'll go over phlebotomy techniques, we'll go over the clinical indications of PureF. There'll be a nice section on facial aesthetic use with PureF, and then we'll wrap it up with kind of the new research that we've been doing on the AL PureF and CPRF protocols with a live demo. And so I'm very excited to announce this new program. It's available at www.prfedu.com, and I look forward to future feedback from colleagues. Thank you. Hello, my name... All right, guys, we're going to get started pretty uh, shortly. I'm just going to play this video a few times as people are, are joining in. Um, because of the COVID situation, many people know that I've created an online platform for Play the Rich Vibrant Education. Um, I've given out the, the free coupon so that people can join. So the code is free COVID. Um, after the course, if you use this code, um, it'll give you free access to all the modules. You'll get eight C credits, and it'll allow you to um, kind of learn everything that's new. Um, we'll kind of go over a lot of the updates in this course uh, today. It'll be about an hour, hour and a half. Um, but again, I'll just play this as people are, are strolling in. It's Dr. Richard Myron, and I'm very happy to announce our new online PureF course. Because many people have been uh, coming to the courses and wanted an online platform, I'm very happy to offer this new convenient way to learn. It's going to be a nine module program uh, for eight CE credits and it'll cover biology of wound healing first in module one. We'll cover differences between PRP and all the advancements to BioPureF. Uh, in the later stages, we'll go over phlebotomy techniques, we'll go over the clinical indications of PureF. There'll be a nice section on facial aesthetic use for PureF, and then we'll wrap it up with kind of the new research that we've been doing on the AL-PureF and CPRF protocols with a live demo. And so I'm very excited to announce this new program. It's available at www.prfedu.com and I look forward to future feedback from colleagues. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Richard Myron, and I'm very happy to announce our new online PureF course. Because many people have been coming to the courses and wanted an online platform, I'm very happy to offer this new convenient way to learn. It's gonna be a nine module program for eight CE credits, and it'll cover biology of wound healing first in module one. We'll cover differences between PRP and all the advancements to BioPureF. Uh, in the later stages, we'll go over phlebotomy techniques. We'll go over the clinical indications of PureF. There'll be a nice section on facial aesthetic use for PureF. And then we'll wrap it up with kind of the new research that we've been doing on the AL PureF and CPRF protocols with a live demo. And so I'm very excited to announce this new program. It's available at www.prfedu.com and I look forward to future feedback from colleagues. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So uh, first things first, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Mark Bechera um, for all the you know help for putting this together and all the work that he's doing with the Canadian Implant Dentistry Network. Uh, for those that don't know, Mark and I were actually classmates many, many years ago. Uh, met him in 2004 at uh, Western in Ontario and so, uh, we've been friends for a long time and uh, gone different paths where he's doing a lot of clinical things and I've done more research things, uh, but I absolutely love what he's done with the Canadian Implant Dentistry Network. Today what I wanted to do was um, kind of discuss what we do today with platelet-rich fibrin and of course as a biologist and molecular and cell biologist, uh, I wanted to spend some time kind of making people understand. So I think in about an hour, an hour and a half, I can really get the point across when you have a centrifuge, how do you program it, right? What are the protocols that you need? And I'll go over three different protocols and kind of the research leading to where we're at today. Um, it's a field that's really evolved a lot and we've done a lot of research in the field on this topic to try and optimize it as much as possible. And simple things like simply setting the right protocols on your centrifuge will make a huge difference in the amount of cell accumulation uh, as well as uh, growth factor release. So that's what I'm going to cover today. And uh, if you stay with me for, uh, throughout the whole thing, like I said, both at the beginning of this video as well as at the end, I give a free coupon code 
uh, which will allow people to you know have access to our online module which we've any very beneficial during these times uh, if you want to learn more about play the rich fiber um, my background is very different than most people I am a dentist I did train in Canada um, but I was awarded a big scholarship in 2009 and uh, the scholarship was from the Canadian government and it allowed me to go anywhere in the world um, to do research a PhD and I decided to go to Bern Switzerland for one particular reason uh, it was the best school in the world research wise and uh, a lot of big names there and so guys like Tony Skoulian uh, did a lot of work with Endogain. So anybody that's heard of Endogain, he's the reason why. Uh, Dr. Boozer's done a lot of work in implant dentistry. And so with Danny, of course, he's done a lot of work with uh, optimizing surface topographies, optimizing bone graphs, a lot on GBR. He's got a fantastic book on GBR. And so between these two colleagues and uh, both of the research guys that were very helpful in my career, Dieter was head of oral histology, Reinhard Gruber was head of oral subbiology. With this team, these are some of the top researchers in the world, um, we were able to kind of put together a team to do research that literally goes from directly in a lab all the way up to uh, being used in clinics and then sold. Always remember that um, when a new implant system comes, it's going to be launched probably in three to five years from when we first start testing it. So what I mean by that is, you know, today if there's a new implant system that was developed by Stroman, we get it in the lab, we do all of our cell studies, all of our animal studies, maybe a year or two goes by, then Danny Boozer will do some clinical studies, and then three, four years later, you know, it gets launched by the company and then FDA cleared and CE cleared. Cool thing about my job is I really get to see all these materials that are about to be launched and I'm kind of living in the future when it comes to dentistry and work with a lot of these uh, top colleagues and so it's a fun place to, to live and work. Uh, big credit to uh, Tony Schooling actually won the one of the top prizes in, in research uh, two weeks ago, International Association for Dental Research and here he was awarded for all the contributions he's made to uh, the field. Of course, Tony, for those that don't know, has been on a lot of our publications on platelet-rich fibrin, and he's currently doing a lot of human histological studies for periodontal regeneration uh, with it. Um, I live in this world where we do a lot of biomaterial things. So I'm constantly uh, given new biomaterials from different companies. We test them. And one of the things that uh, Yufeng Zhang, who worked with me in Bern, Switzerland, and I decided to do was we decided to put you know all of this knowledge together uh, write an extensive book on the topic and then it was uh, published by quintessence and uh, one of the reasons why we wrote it is I always say you know for for clinicians working in everyday uh, dental practices a lot of the knowledge that you guys get on biomaterials is from sales reps and um, it could be good obviously it's good to get new knowledge but at the same time uh, they have an obvious goal of trying to sell more product and they might not actually have the right product for that specific indication. And so this book kind of highlights, you know, what are the regenerative properties of autogenous bone versus allografts versus xenografts, uh, what kind of membranes are there, cross-linked versus non-cross-linked, and then how to use them all properly in an uh, evidence-based way. And a simple question like when to use an allograft versus when to use a xenograft is one that I find a lot of clinicians, a simple question like that, uh, get a little bit mixed up in. And so the book kind of highlights all this. Um, I was shocked to learn actually, this was last year, earlier in 2019, it was the number one most sold book in the world uh, by Quintessence. And so it just goes to show that this space where biomaterials are being tested and developed is really one that clinicians are really seeking to learn more. Um, and I give a little example here of, of one of these new materials. Um, this is kind of the work that I do on a, on a routine basis with different materials. Here's one that's called Tetranite. It's a very interesting one. It's launched by a company called uh, Launchpad Medical. And I got to meet this, these colleagues through uh, Dr. Michael Picos. And of course, I know Dr. David Cochran very well. Um, but in general, you know, they put together a team and they had this new product. And so interestingly, um, what this product was is that these group of researchers out in Boston at MIT and at Harvard were interested, why is it that certain underwater creatures can literally stick on coral reefs or stick to bridges for hours at a time, right? So why is it that, for example, uh, a sandcastle worm can literally just on a bridge underwater in a wet field just boom, stick, and he just stays there for hours? So sure enough, a group of researchers interested in this topic said, what are the proteins? 
when they figured out what proteins uh, they were, they decided to mix it with a bone grafting material. So here's a synthetic bone graft. It's 100% natural. And this bone graft actually, as you work with it, will actually harden over time from those proteins. Um, it's 100% biological. And unlike other type of glue type structures, there's no polymers, it's 100% natural. And so you can use it in a biological uh, fashion. And here's a video um, that just kind of highlights this, and I hope everybody's seen it by now, but if you have not seen it, it's quite shocking when you see the actual strength of this material, because within about 10 minutes, uh, it reaches its maximum strength, and it actually reaches its strength underwater, so it's actually better underwater, but here you can see, uh, even in directly exposed to air and oxygen, it, it's very, very strong, so you get about 300 pounds of forces here. And this is beautiful to see, because of course, you can, you know, glue literally limbs back together. Um, and of course, the orthopedic application of this is, is unlimited. You won't need posts and pins, etc. cetera. Um, but nevertheless, in dentistry, we said, well, why don't we use this type of material around dental implants to get primary stability of these implants? And um, the whole thought process here was, you know, quite simple. You put this in an extraction socket. And uh, after this is done, of course, the implant goes in and then you get primary stability. So it's, you know, a very simple concept. Now, uh, a lot of people see these types of materials and think this is really far out there. This is next generation. You know, we're never going to use this in clinic. Uh, well, I can tell you that uh, a guy like Michael Picos here, for those that don't know him, uh, he's here uh, on the right of my screen, uh, has been using this since October. In his, in his private office. So he lives very close to what I do, and of course I collaborate a lot with him on different courses, and if anybody wants to take good sinus courses or advanced bone grafting courses, I uh, highly recommend them. But the reality is, is that this was the first patient in the world in October that was treated with this, and since then he's been doing case after case after case, so he's doing a case series. And uh, you know we're about to publish some of these results, so it's quite interesting, the work that's done. So here's a little post that he made in his forum uh, with Picos Institute. History was made yesterday as Dr. Picos and his team had the distinct honor of placing Tetranite for the very first time. And of course, there's two pilot centers, so him and Dr. Cochran are two of the guys. And you know, this is something that it's unfortunate that the, the COVID situation has occurred because of course it'll slow things down a little bit. Uh, but these are types of products that are going to be available in the very near future. And this is one that I think a lot of people that are working in the implant field, of course, should know about um, and hopefully will be launched within the next year. Again, if anybody's interested in learning a lot more, is really far advanced in their career with respect to sinus grafting uh, and advanced bone grafting. Uh, this is a book that I highly recommend, Dr. Picos, which was launched last year and has done extremely well in North America. Now, my focus, of course, is on platelet-rich fibrin, and um, I do work in clinics, so it's something that I, I work two, two to three days per week in a private office in Florida, and uh, the rest of the time, of course, I'm spending my time in a, in a research lab and doing research projects, so I'm definitely, without question, very well known for the work that I do in a lab and not in clinics, and that's where I want to share my expertise. Um, what we try and do with platelet-rich fibrin is optimize it as much as we can. I always tell people that it's probably one of the materials that kind of boomed in dentistry very quickly um, and didn't necessarily have all of the quite evidence base that we were looking for in terms of you know academic uh, evidence base and randomized clinical studies, etc. And I think over the years, you know, we've evolved and gotten a lot better. This was a book that we wrote in 2016, um, and I'll talk more about um, kind of where we're at today and how things are updating. Now, with respect to platelet-rich fibrin, it's very straightforward. We have blood. We know certain blood cells are very good for regenerative purposes. Those are platelets. And uh, we have heavier cells, which are red blood cells, and we have white blood cells, which fight infection and, and also help with the regenerative process. PRF, as you know, has been renamed uh, originally leukocyte and platelet-rich fibrin. It's a trademark by uh, Interspin. And um, the reason why they called it that is because these leukocytes, they realized that they're important as well for regeneration. And they also fight infection, which in the oral cavity, we have a lot of bacteria. Now, I want you to really understand what we're doing when we're using a centrifuge to separate out these layers. In one microliter of blood, on average, you have okay, 200,000 platelets and you have 5 million red blood cells. Okay, so in normal blood, you got 200,000 of these little guys 
and you got five million of these heavy guys and your job is you're going to use a spinner and it's going to spin to separate bring these lighter guys in fewer numbers to the top okay white blood cells are in the middle and then red, red blood cells are below okay and that's the goal of centrifugation and red blood cells as you can imagine take up a lot of space as well because they're bigger and they greatly outnumber them so like i said five million versus two hundred thousand and uh, at the end of this protocol, like I said, you get obviously different cells, you get your matrix, you get different growth factors, uh, which is great. But more importantly, like I said, I think everybody understands this now with respect to growth factors and how they fit into platelet-rich fibrin. The three types, there's VEGF, PDGF, TGF beta. And I always like to go over kind of the scenario of, of what these growth factors do. VEGF, of course, increases angiogenesis, so that's the first thing that PureF does, imp improves blood flow. And we know that as we age, of course, blood flow goes down, and so you can help these older patients, definitely. Uh, we know that in smokers, this is definitely uh, a blood flow issue. We know that diabetics, it's the same thing, so there's lots of advantages just there. PDGF helps cells recruit, so this will help any cell type really recruit to the area. And then, of course, TGF-beta will help these cells proliferate, so they start multiplying over time. And it's very important to understand how this works in a clinical situation. So for example, if this is an extraction socket, okay, and I have all my walls, and I you know, use a PureF plug and I plug it in there, um, the advantages, of course, is that with that PureF, and it's been shown in some nice studies that was done by, uh, by Pinto and Kroonin's group, that you could minimize how much dimensional change will occur. How does it work biologically? Well, these three properties. Number one, Blood flow is improved. Number two, you're going to recruit cells. So of course the cells here are coming from the walls. So you get these osteoblasts, these bone cells coming in. These bone cells will then replicate, that's TGF beta. And then you'll have a little bit more bone regeneration here. Now, of course, I'm one of these guys that definitely thinks allografts work better than platelet-rich fibrin. Uh, so without question, I don't want people to take it out of context. But in generally speaking, that's how the biological concept works here with platelet-rich fibrin. Now where clinicians get into trouble is, let's say for example, you've been doing that, doing that, doing that, it seems to be working out pretty well, and then you're missing your buccal plate. Now the problem is, PureF goes inside, and okay, VEGF, step one, is gonna help this area get you know, more blood flow, that's great. Step number two, we're gonna get cell recruitment. So now we have all these bone cells here, they're gonna get recruited to the area, but you also have soft tissue health cells here, and you got no more buccal plate. So these cells are now gonna invade and get recruited to the area. And then afterwards, everything's gonna multiply. Okay, they're gonna proliferate. And what proliferates faster? Soft tissue cells or bone cells? Answer soft tissue cells, and that's where people get into problems, okay? Um, <clears throat> and I think a lot of people misuse and overhype platelet-rich fibrin a little bit. Uh, as a result of these different things. Like I said, we've written many systematic reviews and of course they show very clearly where platelet-rich fibrin is working very well is for soft tissues, for gingival recessions, uh, for intrabony defects is where most of the evidence is there. Of course for bone, you always see one study it's improved slightly, another one no difference and so it's a little bit more variable there. So it's very important to be transparent with some of, the, some of that data. Now a lot of credit goes to the different groups. Um, PRP, PRGF, like I said, these colleagues here have done a great amount of work with respect to bringing this technology to dentistry. And of course, Dr. Shakrun is kind of one of the guys that has said, let's remove the anticoagulants because that's going to inhibit wound healing. And quite honestly, it makes perfect logical sense, right? If you, I always give the example, if you cut yourself and then you start bleeding, 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 the first thing that needs to happen for you to heal is a clot needs to form cells and growth factors get trapped in the clot and of course then regeneration will occur well if you have an issue um, with clotting because you have anticoagulants that's going to delay that healing slightly and that's where i think you know prp prgf have kind of limited uh total regeneration potential of course they both still work and they have great evidence um, you know i've i've gotten a little bit closer with with uh, dr marks and dr garg who have uh, said, you know, over the years, many years ago, they've created basically what is PRF, but they call it PRP, and they just said they either use or don't use anticoagulants, and so, you know, there's been a lot of debate and confusion in the field over, over all these things, and, you know, these are things that happened 20 years ago that I don't care too much about today. I'm really trying to optimize the field as much as we can for, for the future. Now, very straightforward, like I said, the one disadvantage of play the rich fibrin, of course, is that you know it's gonna clot, and so you got to do your blood draw, 
you got to put it in the machine rather quickly and we'll go over how much time you have to actually put it in the machine because we actually did those studies and then of course you get your layer separation where platelet-rich fibrin is taken from the top always remember as well i cannot stress this point enough if you start spinning 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 very fast the more you spin the faster you spin the more the cells they go down to the bottom of this tube right so you're trying to collect platelet-rich fibrin at the top but there's really a sweet spot which with how fast you can go because if you spin too slow they don't separate properly if you spin too fast they all go to the bottom and so there's really a sweet spot with how to optimize uh, platelet-rich fibrin and I think is the problem as a clinician is that a lot of times you don't actually see whether or not the cells are in that fibrin matrix they're not in there what they look like how they behave and that's more work that's done at the basic research level and I'll show some work that was done by um, Sharam Ganazzi out in Germany that's really kind of pioneered this whole field I personally only think there's three protocols that are needed for platelet-rich fibrin and um, when we were developing the BioPRF system with a, a big implant company we wanted to make things as simple as possible you know they gave them different names there's a lot of different commercial names etc uh, the tubes are literally just called liquid PRF tubes and solid PRF tubes to make things very straightforward and of course the CPRF is the concentrated version of this and I'll explain how we got to that point these are really the three protocols that are most frequently utilized and I'm going to show how we actually got to you know optimizing these three different protocols and kind of where the field is at and then we'll talk about uh, you know the tubes are so important a lot of people think one red tube with a red cap is the same as another company's red tube with a red cap and that's one of the areas that I think clinicians really be a lot more knowledgeable on you know with respect to these tubes you know the tubes matter way 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 more than the centrifuge so if you give me any centrifuge I can probably optimize it but if you give me the wrong set of tubes, I definitely, you know, cannot help you out with respect to making PRF as most effective as possible. And the funny thing about the tubes is that, you know, the tubes range in price from like 85 cents each to $1.35. And that's where, you know, the biggest effect is. And I hope that's the main message you get from, uh, from this uh, little lecture here. Now, very simply put, with the tubes, there's two types. You got red tubes, you got white tubes, or you got orange ones or green ones or whatever colors they have. I'm not too concerned about the colors, but I want people to understand what is the goal of these tubes, okay? Um, much like a dental implant surface, you know, I was actually part of some of the studies where implants were going from titanium acid etch to hydrophilic implant surfaces. And I, was, I remember being in Canada, actually, it was my master's project. In 2006, we were given uh, a set of SLA active implants from Stroman. And the difference between that and SLA surfaces was just the hydrophilicity. Same surface, everything was the same, but one implant is more hydrophilic. And of course, now we have the Nobel Active and many implant companies today have these hydrophilic implant surfaces. What was the goal for these implants? And it was very straightforward. If you made a surface that was more hydrophilic, it's more water loving. And so if you had these platelets, which are these regenerative cells, and you have a surface that's more hydrophilic, they would then go bind to this hydrophilic surface and when they would bind they would degranulate growth factors would get released and the regeneration process would happen and that would make the implant uh, osteointegrate a little bit faster and you see some great videos you know companies have done a great job where they take these implants they drop them in a little bit of blood and then you see the blood actually either rushing up the implant or sometimes they put it in for <clears throat> a few minutes and they actually pull up and you see the clot is actually hanging on to the implant which is uh, very very cool to see this just has to go with the surface the more hydrophilic it is the more water loving the more platelets will blind, bind the better the clot formation it is the exact same thing in PRF tubes so if you have a red tube and if you're an educator that works in this field really consider this and teach this to to other people because it's important if that surface is very hydrophilic okay and typically a material that's very hydrophilic is a glass surface it will clot faster there's no question and I'll show you kind of the videos and stuff a little bit later if another way to do this of course is with the silica coated plastic and that's the what interest bin uses where they have a plastic tube on the outside and they basically just spray coat glass on the inside and that is more hydrophilic as well so the clot will form not quite as effectively um, but more importantly with those with those tubes you'll see that the actual spray coated glass particles actually come off the walls and into the PRF and have been a little bit of uh, issues with that as well or reports from the literature suggesting against that now on the other end of the spectrum 
completely the opposite with the white tube. What you're trying to do with the white tube is make it as hydrophobic as possible. So you want that to stay liquid as long as possible. So you don't want those cells to bind. The more hydrophobic, the more they just kind of hang out and stay in liquid phase, okay? And so again, more hydrophilic on one side, clots very well. If you want a tube, and we've made tubes that will last literally 60 minutes, it'll stay liquid. And that's done with very hydrophobic tubes. Okay, everybody knows and works with platelet-rich fibrin, so I'm quite sure I can skip over these videos. But, you know, the advantages in the bone grafting world is basically related to its handling. Um, when when uh, large clinicians and guys like Dr. Picos, etc., uh, that, I, that I teach with use platelet-rich fibrin, a lot of it has to do with the improvement in its handlings, okay, as well as the fact that if you're going to do a sinus augmentation, you can literally use half the amount of bone grafts, so you save a little bit of money, and you add in the properties that are going to help with angiogenesis and other things. So again, uh, you get this nice handling properties with these sticky bones, which I think majority of people in this audience, I'm sure, know what this stuff is by now. Now, we did a cool study. <clears throat> in this study, was done with one of our students, uh, Dr. Dam, or sorry, Nika Dam. Um, she's not a doctor yet. But um, her goal was to figure out how long do you have bef between when you do a blood draw and when it goes into the machine. And we actually got this question from many clinicians who were asking this problem. They say, you know, Dr. Myron, we're always having issues with respect to clot size. Some of them are big, some of them are small. What's going on? And so about two and a half years ago, we addressed this question in a, in a study. And the way that we did the study was we said, okay, let's draw blood from one person and this donor is going to donate six tubes of blood. The first vial is going to go into machine number one right away and we're going to start the spin cycle. Second tube goes in number two, but we're going to start it 30 seconds later and then 60 seconds later, then 90 seconds later, then 120 seconds later. And then we're going to see, you know, what happens to the size of these membranes, how the cells actually separate. And uh, it was quite interesting. <clears throat> we saw the data. And within 90 seconds, these membranes get significantly smaller. And by 120 seconds, they're much smaller, about a quarter of the size. And on top of that, the cells don't separate nearly as effectively. So I want you to think about this logically. If this is a tube and you got blood in this tube, and if I have a red tube especially, the red tube wants to clot, right? So this red tube is hydrophilic. It's going to help the, the blood actually clot. So if it sits there for a long period of time, over time, you get fibrinogen and thrombin, and they're slowly going to convert into fibrin. So if you've let it sit there for two minutes, some of that's starting to convert. And then all of a sudden, you put in a centrifuge, you want to separate your layers, but now you can't separate as effectively. And uh, because, of course, the fibrin clots there, the cells get trapped, it becomes more difficult. And that's what happens here. And so I always, in our courses, when we teach this, we tell people, get all blood tubes in the centrifuge within 90 seconds. Okay, very, very important. A lot of people will make sticky bone and at those protocols you'll draw white tubes and red tubes at the same time. Okay, so very important question here. Which tubes do you draw first? Answer, very simply, think about this logically. If you're going to draw, let's say, six tubes, that first tube that you draw is going to be sitting out there in the corner for, let's say, 90 seconds. So it takes about 15 seconds each to, to draw one of these tubes. Which tube do you actually want sitting there waiting while you're doing the rest? Do you want a hydrophobic tube that's not going to clot? Or do you want a hydrophilic red tube that is going to clot? And the answer is you want the one that's not going to clot. And the reason why is because if you have a white tube or an orange one or a green one, whatever the color may be, if that one's sitting there longest, you want to make sure that that's a hydrophobic tube that's not going to allow the clotting to occur. And then you can put it in the machine and then you separate your layers thereafter. Okay. So blood draws, like I said, get them done between 60 to 90 seconds. And uh, if you're an experienced user of platelet-rich fiber, and I tell people, you know, if you have your staff doing it in your office, time them. Time them to see. Because a lot of people, 90 seconds goes by a lot faster than you think, number one. And um, number two, you know, it's a good idea to, to, to time it and to relate it to actually the membrane sizes that you're producing in your, in your office. That's where a lot of the variability occurs. Now, why is it that sometimes you have bigger, smaller membranes in different populations, okay? And answer to this is just as a result of the hematocrit counts, okay? Always remember that you're separating blood based on density. So if I'm a person that has a lot more red blood cells, my blood is a lot denser. And so if I have denser blood, when I spin and separate the layers, it's a lot harder to achieve separation. Okay, on average, when you look at this, females have 
uh, hematocrit counts that are lower, and as a result, their layers will separate you know, more effectively. So you get 17% bigger membranes in females. And it's the same thing with old people. With old people, exact same thing, right? When you're separating these layers, old people have less red blood cells, so as you age, you know, they decrease. Separation occurs a little bit faster. So when we're actually working in practice and you have a patient come in, so we have, you know, the protocols that are designed for platelet-rich fibrin is just, you know, the standard for that population, which has a bell curve, of course, and, you know, you try and hit the middle for the average person. But if you're this practitioner that wants to optimize things a little bit further, always remember that an older person is going to have a bigger membrane. You're going to separate a little bit faster, okay? The worst patients to, or not the worst, but the ones that generate the smallest membranes are young males, right? Because they have the highest amount of red blood cells and especially with athletes. And this is important because if you're one of these clinics that does a lot of third molar extractions, you know, I'd recommend in those cases there, if you got a 17 year old man, athletic plays on his high school football or basketball team, you know, this is somebody that you can consider pumping up the protocol about 20% faster just because you understand how these blood layers actually separate. So that's a, you know, a nice little trick there. Um, I got this slide from uh, Dr. Delia Tuttle, and when I saw it, I asked her if I could have it because it kind of explains the history of PRP all the way up to uh, where we're at today and uh, the differences. And I'll go through a little bit of the research and why it is that things have changed. Um, and I think uh, between the years, you know, 2014 to 2016, there was a lot of modifications made to PRF to improve it. And uh, Dr. Ganazzi has given a lot of credit for the work that he's done there. And of course, more recently, we've gone more towards using horizontal centrifugation since last year, uh, which has further improved the results. And I'll kind of talk about the data that's uh, led us here. Now, as I mentioned earlier, always remember that when you're separating these layers, it's based on density. And the faster you spin, the more the cells, of course, are going to the bottom of the tubes. This was a slide that was uh, directly from Ganazzi's lab, so one of his papers. And here what it is is the separation between the two layers, so between the ye yellow plasma and the red blood cells. Uh, what's brown here is all the white blood cells. And what he found was that all the white blood cells were either located right at the base of this membrane or at the bottom of these tubes. And that was with the original LPRF protocols. And uh, he made a very important point. He said, you know, when you take this big PRF membrane, all the cells are right here at the bottom. And he's like, the top three quarters of that membrane basically has nothing in it. And so we need to figure out a way to optimize this and get more of the cells more evenly distributed throughout that PRF plot. And that was work that his group did. Uh, what our group had done was we looked at the growth factor release, so this was done with Misako Kobayashi, and I'm quite sure if you read some papers on platelet-rich fibrin, you've definitely seen her, her name come up. She's actually, in the last five years, she's the most cited researcher on platelet-rich fibrin therapy in the whole world um, as a result of her contributions that she's made, which are enormous in this field. And what she found was that if we looked at, for example, here, TGF-beta-1, and you looked at the growth factors that are being released over time, well, if you had the same person's blood, so everything's the same, machine's the same, all you're doing is you're changing the protocols to lower speed, and this one here is lower speed in time, then you'd have better growth factor release. Okay? And this really clearly showed to clinicians and practitioners, you know, when you have blood, depending on how you spin it, you'll have a big difference in growth factor. So if you're gonna go through the effort of drawing somebody's blood, buying the centrifuge equipment and everything, you know, make sure your protocols are optimized because, you know, you get a lot more growth factor release if you do that correctly. Now, one of the comments we get, and this is from, you know, the first book that was written was, you know, play the rich fibrin. If we go with different protocols, we'll be bigger, smaller. And I want people to understand, again, kind of the biology here. When I spin very fast for a long period of time, so let's say I do the original LPRF protocols and I go 2,700 RPM for 12 minutes. I separate my layers. Okay. Of course, a lot of the cells are at the bottom and that's not what we want, but the longer I spin and the faster I spin, the more this is going to make a bigger membrane. If I go slower, my membrane is going to be smaller because I'm not pushing as much to the bottom, but I have more cells. And if I go slower for less time, and that's what this one here represents, you get a lot more cells and a lot more growth factor release. Okay. So logically speaking, if you're a clinician, it made more sense for you to draw two tubes of blood like this as opposed to one big one like the LPRF and of course it would cost you an extra let's say one dollar for this tube 
but each one of these tubes would have four times more cells. Okay? And that was kind of a, a big advancement that was made in that field. And of course, in, in Ganazzi's lab, he showed a lot of nice data with respect to uh, placing these PRF membranes under the skin and, and doing quite nice work with that. Uh, let me go back here. Around the year 2017, you know, there was a lot of commercial debate. And uh, I always joke around with other colleagues because when we work in research, of course, we need a centrifuge for everything. Um, and if you go to a high-end research lab, we use them all the time in cell biology to spin cells down and, you know, do different things when we use these centrifuges. And the reality is, you know, the reason why G-Force was even, you know, put about in RCF values was so that if I was working in my lab here and I had a certain kind of centrifuge, I could give a G-Force value in one of my publications and that G-Force value could be used in another part of the world, in another lab with another device, and they could repeat the experiments. So if I was doing something cool with stem cells, you know, over here in Canada or in the United States, <clears throat> I could show people what I did with whatever devices I had. As long as I used proper G-forces, I could send this off to Switzerland or France or, or China or India or wherever, and they could replicate that. And so we've seen so much commercial debate on this topic, which has been a little bit unfortunate, because what's happened is that the people that didn't have necessarily this, this device that had this set protocol, they might not be getting the, the right outcomes. And so Yufeng Zhang and I, uh, we designed this study where we said, you know what, we're going to show in this study that it doesn't matter which machine you're going to use, you can generate pretty good results with any machine, but you have to be able to optimize it correctly with the right centrifugation forces. And so we took two salvin systems, we two, took two of uh, Shakrun's duo systems, and we took two of the intraspin systems, and what we did was, from every single person when we were doing this project, we were drawing two tubes of blood for every machine, spinning them at high G-force and low G-force. Um, and we had them all set and everything was calculated. And uh, just to show people that, uh, you know, any of these machines could, could obtain good results. Now, we've learned many, many things from this paper. Like I said, it was done two years ago. And this is Yufeng right here is one of my, my best friends. Um, and we share a lab space together out in China where we do a lot of work. And uh, the way you separate layers, of course, is from the G-force. And always remember, you know, the biggest mistake that I see both clinicians make and I see companies make is that they don't understand that when I say spin at 1300 RPM, that's only for this machine, okay? Because if you have a machine that's this big and there's a certain G-force because this thing's spinning around in a circle, if all of a sudden this machine is this big, well, you can't keep spinning at 1300 RPM because it's going a lot faster spinning way out there and at that bigger velocity what happens more of the cells go to the bottom okay now that doesn't mean that that bigger machine can't work it just means you have to optimize it properly by doing some of the calculations and if you want to learn more about this like i said in the online platform uh, we have the calculations there and you can figure that out um, and in this paper as well you can read through it and figure out how we did these calculations now when we were doing this study you know we learned something that was so interesting because we had everything set Everything was ready to go. And while we were doing the study, we, we saw that certain tubes were producing bigger membranes. And we said, based on the calculations, this makes absolutely no sense. And it was the first time that we realized, actually, the tubes themselves have a huge impact on the final size of the, of the PRF, okay? Um, and uh, one thing that we've learned particularly was these plastic tubes that were silica coated produced by far the smallest uh, membranes. And so what we did, we said, you know what? We're starting to figure out that these tubes matter a lot. And amazingly, nobody's really looked into that. This was about two years ago. And so we said, let's grab three different tubes from three different companies, and we're gonna draw two tubes from the same person. So let's say you take my blood, you're gonna grab six tubes. You're gonna grab them in a random order, and we're gonna take all six tubes and put them in the same machine, on the same protocol, same settings, everything's the same. The only difference is, uh, the tubes and that's how we could really look at that and what we did was we took six tubes put them in the salvin took another six tubes put them in the duo quattro here took another six tubes and put them in the intraspin and between all that then you could really say okay we've done a very well controlled study here now let's see what's going on when we spin with the size of the membranes and the layer separations and uh you know, at the time, uh, this videos are more than two years old. When I was doing this, I, I told the, the students and also the colleagues, I said, let's film the whole damn thing because the results are so dramatically shocking that I wanted a 
big video that kind of showed everything. And I don't show them all in courses, et cetera, because they're just too long. But have a look at this. This right here in this top layer is the interlock machine. And then you see here, there's S for salvin tube, C for chacroon tube, and I for intraspin tube. And what you see is the intraspin ones are way smaller than the two glass tubes here. And same thing here, this is the chacroon machine. This is the salvin tube, the intraspin tube, and the chacroon tube. And again, the intraspin tubes are smallest here. And the chacroon ones were the biggest uh, in these studies. Now, when we actually looked at the data and we quantified everything, this is the machine, so intraspin machine, process for PRF machine, salvin dental machine, intraspin tube, process for PRF tube, salvin tube, and you see, no matter which machine you spun on, always the intraspin was the smallest, and always the glass tubes were the largest, okay? And the one point that we made in this article was that, have a look, now this is the same data, everything's the same, the only difference is the way that the, the graph is displayed. Now we have the tubes at the bottom. So here's the intraspin tube, here's a process for PRF tube, here's a salvin tube. And what we realized was that, um, the intraspin tube, of course, were way smaller in all groups, and these ones here were the biggest, the process for PRF tubes. Look at the difference between the actual machines. Between the intraspin machine and the process for PRF, only about a 15% difference here. Look at the difference between the tubes. The tube is more than 200% difference, okay? And that's why I always say it's amazing. People will spend, you know, thousands of dollars even more for a, a, a centrifuge without paying attention to how important these tubes actually are. The tubes matter way more than the actual machines do. And that was very, very relevant for, for our team at the time. Another thing we realized was that um, with the intraspin machine, it had the best results with the process for PRF tube. Okay, so that's how we generated two years ago, I would say that was my recommendation and that's what I gave in courses. And the funny thing was, is that um, it just go to show you that these companies were not optimized at all because again, you had to get a machine from this company and a tube from another company. Um, and it really, you know, led to us wanting to develop things that were a little bit more effective. In the year 2019, uh, we did this work, of course, in 2018. It was published in 2019. We, we did the study, and I think it was the best study I've ever published on platelet-rich fibrin. Um, it was titled, A Novel Method for Evaluating and Quantifying Cell Types in PRF and an Introduction to Horizontal Centrifugation. And there was a lot of things that, you know, over time, we've been doing research in this field now for about eight years. As we're doing all this lab work, we said, you know what? There are real big problems with the re research in this field, and I'm going to go through them. One thing that we found was that Ganazzi's work with his histology was well done, there's no question. And um, he could find all the cells down at the bottom here. The problem with doing histology of platelet-rich fibrin, and we have papers on it, there's no question, I, it's needed, there's no question as well, is that an individual can look at this PRF membrane and when you put it in an actual paraffin block and you start you know, cutting it and sectioning it, you don't always know the exact orientation and another problem with the, that technique, in my opinion, is that a lot of people will show things that are not representative, let's say, of everything. So in histology, you're just looking at a tiny little area. And if you see a lot of cells here, you can just show that one little area and that's it. And so one oftenly used procedure that people do is they spin the cycles. They take out the plasma layer, like you see here in number two and number three. And then they'll send this plasma layer to a CBC and do a complete blood count. Okay, and that makes sense. So I could say, after my spin cycle, I'm gonna take the liquid platelet-rich fibrin or the liquid PRP, I'm gonna send it to a CBC, I'm gonna get a value, and I'm gonna compare that value to baseline whole blood, and then we're gonna say we have four to five times more platelets here. And that's how research is done. Now the point that we made in one of our articles was the following. We said, well, you know, when you look at the low speed concept, and you look at how cells separate, and you look at Ganazzi's work in his histology, the problem with doing it this way is that if you spin LPRF protocol, you spin fast, and all the cells bunch up here, which is awful for a clinician because now all your cells are here, and you use this membrane and you lay it down for a GBR procedure over top of collagen, you want regeneration everywhere, but it's only happening in one spot. But if a colleague was to drop this liquid platelet-rich fibrin, the layer, and give it to the CBC, and you used another protocol which was more evenly distributed, the difference between this guy and this guy at the end, you know, they, they report, you know, this APRF right here will have 20% more, more cells. Fine. You know, I agree. And we've, we've confirmed that, no question. 
But the problem was is that you don't actually take into consideration the implication that this layer of the LPRF, let's say, is just completely no cells anywhere, and then a lot at the bottom, okay? And so we developed this system, and that's why it was called the Novel Method for Evaluating Platelet-Rich Fibrin. We said, you know, instead of taking the whole plasma layer, the whole upper layer, let's take that tube of blood and let's separate it one cc at a time. Boom, 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 all the way down to layer number 10. And the reason why we did that is we said, you know what, if we do it this way here and the protocols don't have any cells in the upper three layers, it's going to be very, very obvious by doing it this way here. And this was a method that we developed because we said, you know what, if you do it this way here, you can't bullshit. Okay, there's no way you can bullshit the system. You literally take out one cc at a time all the way down. And with pipettes, of course, it's very, very accurate. You can easily take out one cc at a time. And uh, that's how we did it. Now, I make a point here because you're always going to run into one layer where you have some of the plasma and some of the red cell layer. And that's the buffy coat region. And that's the area where you're going to see in these graphs that I'm about to show you a lot of concentrations of cells there. Okay, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And so, like I said, when you do this, this is the LPRF protocol. So for those that have the interest spin, um, if you have this machine, I'll, uh, before I forget, spin it at 1500 RPM for eight minutes. Okay, you'll get much better results, but I just want to show you the data. Okay, here we go, one, two, three, four. Always remember that in this case here, the fifth layer has some plasma in red. And you can see from this image here in the middle, you can really get out you know, a nice separation. And these, these are very accurate tools that we can utilize. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there's the 10 groups. Now away we go to the data. I'm going to explain this as uh, clearly and easily as I can. So number of leukocytes here, number of platelets, number of lymphocytes, number of red blood cells, number of neutrophils, number of monocytes. So if I look at red blood cells, easiest group to understand, the control is the whole value. So that's at the very average of this patient, that's what I have. One, two, three, four, these are the top four layers. So where there's only plasma now, there's no red blood cells, they all get pushed down. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. all the red blood cells are down at the bottom. Makes sense. Look at the platelets. Platelets are super concentrated all at layer five. Okay, so they're all right there, which means that, and same thing with leukocytes, which are even worse. Leukocytes, you're spinning so fast that the leukocytes are actually going more in the red layer than they are into the, into the plasma layer. So I always make the joke, you know, they call this leukocyte and platelet-rich fibrin. It's actually leukocyte poor. There's less leukocytes in platelet-rich fibrin uh, in this LPRF protocol um, than actually whole blood. And uh, of course, that's a trade name. And, um, you know, it's a little bit shocking when you do this data and it confirms exactly what was found histologically by Ganazzi's group. But this was a nice, clear way to really show very convincingly what was going on here after these spin protocols. Now, when they sp spun slower, and again, this is thanks to Ganazzi's group in Germany that found this, um, you saw, look at the platelets here. Now they're more evenly distributed, okay? We found as well, though, that the leukocytes were still in the bottom layers, okay? And I'm going to explain why that occurs a little bit later. That happens as a result of using a fixed angle centrifuge, okay? And I'll explain why that happens in the, in the coming slides. But again, this was a way that with the same machine that you have, as long as you change the G-force and you use a better protocol, you wouldn't be pushing as many cells down to the bottom of these PRF tubes. So again, a lot of credit goes to this group for uh, having developed this and doing a lot of work in this field. This is a nice little summary uh, what happened. So again, with the LPRF protocol, all the cells are getting bunched up right at the zone. And if you use different protocols, you can more evenly concentrate them through the upper layers and you maintain more of these cells in the upper layer as well. Now, I remember looking at the data and I said, you know, it's kind of funny. All the cells are in this fifth layer. So when we spin at the LPRF protocol, all the cells are gathered right in that layer. And I said, you know, that layer number five, it's got a yellow component and a red component, if you remember. And one of the students said, you know, how do we know if these cells are actually in the red portion or in the red po or the yellow portion? And I said, well, let's test it. Okay, so we did that. And uh, of course, when you look at the graphs, here's the number of red blood cells. Here's the average. How many red blood cells do you have in the yellow layer? You have none. They're all in the red cell layer. But look at the platelets. You got a lot of platelets in the yellow layer, so more in the yellow, but you got a lot of them in this red layer. Okay. And look at the leukocytes, even worse. Most of the leukocytes in this layer are actually found in the red zone, okay? And that makes sense. When you look at the original graph here, there's more leukocytes in the red layer 
Okay, so there actually there's a lot of them that are found in this in this red zone layer. And I'm going to speak about how this paper here really changed the way that we actually harvest liquid platelet fiber now. This paper came out, I don't know any of these colleagues, but it's a good one, called uh, Influence of Fractionation Methods on Physical and Biological Properties of Injectable Platelet-Rich Fibrin. And in this study, what was done was two fractions were used to harvest IPRF. The yellow IPRF was harvested only the upper yellow layer, while the red IPRF fraction was collected both the yellow and the red zone of the Buffy coat. So they were saying, well, if a lot of the cells are in this red layer, you know, right at this portion, let's take the yellow only and let's compare it with the yellow and a little bit of the red and let's compare the data and what they found at day 7 and 14 pdgf concentrations were significantly significantly higher in the red iprf compared to the yellow group okay why am i saying this and showing this when you draw a liquid portion of platelet-rich fibrin always remember that more of your cells are going to the buffy coat and a lot of them are found in that little red layer okay so Every time that I see clinicians working with this or they post videos on Facebook, etc., sometimes I see somebody where this is the yellow layer and they go only to like halfway into the yellow and take up the yellow because they don't want to get any of the red. And I say, that's a mistake because the majority of the cells are actually found right at that layer, at the junction, and even some within the red blood cell layer. Okay, so no harm there in taking a little bit of these red blood cells. Now, I remember reading this paper too. I was a reviewer for it, another good one. And uh, this one here opened up my eyes big time. And uh, I can go back and relate to some of the old work that I have done on, on injectable platelet-rich fibrin. Uh, in any event, they published this work, Injectable Platelet-rich Fibrin, Self-Content, Morphological, and Protein Characterization. And in the work, they showed leukocytes were only slightly improved when compared to whole blood, and platelets were only slightly increased when compared to whole blood as well. And I remember looking at this and I said, geez, you know, we had actually never quantified the cell types uh, up until 2019 in there. We always said, what are the growth factors released? How much biological activity? And I'll show you that paper because I saw this paper and I said, you know, ever strange, these IPRF protocols are not really accumulating this huge concentration. You know, there's no fourfold or sixfold increase in platelets like you see typically in the PRP studies. Okay, so this was a really one that kind of scratched our head a little bit. And uh, they actually showed that the, the growth factor release was actually lower than compared to whole blood. And uh, I went back to my paper, you know, this was something that a lot of smart people were on this paper. And I remember when I wrote it, uh, again, received here in 2016, injectable platelet-rich fiber and opportunities in regenerative dentistry. Something that we always tried to figure out, this was between me, uh, Masaka was part of this paper, Dr. Hernandez, Kandilov, Dr. Yufeng Zhang, Ganazzi, and, and Joseph Shakrun. We had got this data and we were comparing IPRF to PRP. And, you know, of course, the advantage of the liquid platelet-rich fibrin or the IPRF is that you have a fibrin matrix so it can trap the growth factors and then it can release them a little bit more slowly and a lot of advantages for the fibrin network. So you looked at cell migration and it was improved of course for the IPRF here but sometimes we were getting data and when we looked at proliferation it was actually better for PRP and we were scratching our head we said how does this make any sense because if you have the same amount of platelets you know, in both groups, and one of them has the fibrin scaffold and the slow and gradual release process, how does this data make sense? And this is published, like I said, it's in our, in our papers where uh, sometimes the PRF was working better, other times the PRP was working better. And when we looked at the growth factor release especially, and again, this is directly from our papers, we compared PRP to IPRF, and of course PRP here was significantly better when it came to growth factor release. And, you know, we scratched our heads for a very long time to try and figure out why this happened. And back then, you know, I had no idea. Today, I actually know why, because of all the studies that have come out since then. But back then in 2016, you know, we were just getting a feel for what was going on and, and trying to figure out how to actually improve this. And, of course, we've developed now protocols uh, that make a little bit more sense. When we actually spin the IPRF protocols here, I got a little video playing here on, on the right here, but I want you to look at the screen here. This is the same layer separation okay, that occurs when we go at the IPRF protocols, which was the 60G, so 7800 RPM for three to four minutes. Look at how many platelets and leukocytes get increased. So of course you get an increase of platelets, so I would say probably two to three fold compared to control, but almost no shift in leukocytes, very minimal. And look at, more importantly, how many cells you're leaving in the bottom layers here. So actually the problem with these protocols, and we didn't realize it at the time, was that there's a point 
where you just spin too slow for not enough time. And that makes perfect sense. It's logical, right? So we were saying, you know, with the IPRF, we go lower, we go lower with, with APRF and APRF plus, we're getting better results. But if you keep pushing it lower and lower and lower, you reach a point where you've only done a three minute spin cycle and actually it wasn't enough time for, or it wasn't fast enough for the cells to actually accumulate in the upper layers. And that's why some of those papers found the, the results that they did and kind of critiqued the IPRF protocols a little bit. Now, when we look at cells, this is actually the size of these cells. So here's a red blood cell, that's the size of it. That's a little platelet, that's a white blood cell. One thing you'll notice is that the red blood cells and the white blood cells are very similar in size. And as a biologist, that makes it very hard to separate these two cell types because one, they're very close in density, and two, they're very close in size. And it's one of the reasons why you see in a lot of the, the work that we showed was that on that fixed angle centrifuge, it was very, very difficult to actually get these white blood cells in the upper layers. And it's one of the reasons why we see actually lower concentration, especially in the uh, liquid platelet fiber and LPRF protocols. Okay, sorry, the LPRF ones. Um, I want you to think about this logically. When we actually have a centrifuge, and this is our rotor, okay? The way we separate layers is the difference between the RCF min and the RCF max of this tube. And whatever that difference is between the minimum force on that tube of the G-force and the maximum, the cells will separate based on their density between what this gradient difference is, okay? So of course, in a lab, you know, for years and years and years, we always did it this way here, and that's called the horizontal centrifuge. It's called the swing out bucket. And the reason why we use a swing out bucket is of course, because when this thing swings out, the tube is completely horizontally. It's got the maximum difference between the min and the max of that tubes. It's just logical, right? And I promise you, if you go to any university lab, they all spin on horizontal centrifuges because it's better for separating these layers. Now, why is platelet-rich fibrin produced on a fixed angle centrifuge? And the answer is these machines are much cheaper, okay? Original PRP protocols all were spun on horizontal centrifuges. So when you look at Bob Marx's work and when you look at uh, Arun Garg's work, always, always, always with horizontal centrifuges. But their original machines were like, you know, $8,000 or $10,000 for their kits and it was very expensive. And of course, these fixed angle centrifuges are much cheaper because they're just fixed angle and, you know, not as, not as much power required to, let's say, you know, flip these tubes out completely horizontally. They're also a little bit smaller, so a little bit better for, you know, office use because they're smaller. But <clears throat> over time, what's happened, of course, is that companies have been able to develop smaller systems that are horizontal. This is what it looks like. Okay, this is the BioPRF system that we helped uh, co-develop. Tubes going up and down. When they start spinning, tubes fling out horizontally. And that allows these layers to separate, you know, very easily. A whole kit like this about three thousand dollars us okay so pricing has gone down dramatically with these these different devices now a few things to consider here and the one that i like to point out you know and I, it's very very obvious and we've known this for a long time just nobody's ever really done anything about it when you try and separate layers okay the first thing that happens if you're a little red blood or you're a big red blood cell here you start spinning everything goes to the back of the tube so red blood cell goes boom to the back and then you have high g-force and you're heavier so you're going down okay so you start going down if you're a little platelet and you start down here first thing that happens you go boom and this little platelet's got to climb all the way up this hill this mountain while all these red blood cells are going down so imagine that this is your centrifuge angle your little platelet starting way down here he's trying to slowly climb up but you got all these red blood cells that are here and they're going down and everything's occurring on the back surface of this tube and what happens is those platelets can't make it to the top because they actually get trapped in some of these red blood cells. When you go horizontally, of course, then these cells can just very easily free pass. Okay, so that's a, a big advantage. A lot of people have you know, commented on the difference between the layer separations and how much better they are on horizontal. Of course they are. When you spin horizontally, you get a you know, straight line. Everybody, I'm sure, that does a lot of platelet fiber and has seen the angles that are produced on these tubes, right? And that is a result of spinning on a fixed angle centrifuge, okay? But more importantly than that, what I like to highlight, of course, is, like I said, these cells that get trapped back there. And this image right here is really one that's been kind of the cornerstone. A lot of people have been using it in their presentations because it explains very clearly and logically what happens in the spin cycle. 
okay? RCF, the cells all move to the back. When all the cells are in the back there, they get jammed up back there and they're trying to separate and those poor little platelets and the white blood cells especially, they don't actually make it to the upper layers. It's harder to separate. Whereas when you go horizontally, these cells can just very easily free pass, okay? And so that's, you know, common knowledge in a lab. Um, and of course, it's been brought to market for people that use PureF in, in clinical practice now. Now, a lot of people that spin on fixed angles will often see these little dots here. Okay, these are common as well. What are these little red dots? These red dots are actually those cells that are literally slamming back there. You know, look at this tube here after a spin protocol. Why do you see only the red dots on one side where the angle is on the back and you see all the little red dots there? Okay, what happened? Again, fixed angle centrifuge. The cells all got slammed back there. All the dots occurred because of that. And they're not just at the top portion. These red dots are all the way down the tube. You just can't see them here. But if you look histologically, you see the clumps that are forming. And unfortunately, what you see is when you have all these clumps everywhere, below them, you see the light cells. And the light cells trying to go up, but they can't because of all those clumps that are formed. And that's one of the reasons why you can't effectively separate your layers uh, by using a uh, fixed angle centrifuge. Okay? And again, like I said, there are different classes of centrifugation systems. Give me any fixed angle, I can probably optimize it for you. Give me any horizontal one, I can probably optimize it for you. Okay? There's two classes. When you're making things based on separating density, like we were doing in platelet-rich fibrin or PRP, you got to go horizontal to get better results. And it's literally like you know, four times better. It's a big difference. Okay? And I'll show kind of the reason why fixed angle centrifuges. They also have a rule, uh, but it's not to separate layers or based on density. Now, um, the study that we did with the layer-by-layer -layer transition, I remember this paper here came out, a nice one, was done by Professor Kowazi's group. I had not met him at the time, but he's done a lot of great work, and I met him actually in 2020 at a conference, and I'll speak about his work. But in his work, what he showed was the same thing very similarly, but he, he created what he called the distal surface and a proximal surface in his paper, and I said, you know, that's a good idea. Uh, to call it by that. And what he showed in his papers was that when you spin on these fixed angle centrifuges, so for example, here the APRF protocol, again, everything in brown here, he was showing that all of the cells are accumulating on the distal surface of these uh, tubes. So again, you take PRF, and now not only if you spin too fast, they're all down here, they're all on the back wall, okay, and a lot of them stuck at the Buffy Coat region. And uh, this we reprinted in one of our, our papers that was just accepted uh, recently. Another very, very important study for, for our group. Look at the density of platelets, white blood cells, and red blood cells. Okay? You'll notice that, of course, platelets are the lighter guys, but look at the difference in density between these white blood cells and red blood cells. So they're very similar. There's not a lot of difference there. But more importantly, look at the frequency. For one microliter, you have 200,000 platelets, 5,000 white blood cells, 5 million red blood cells, okay? So every time that you have 5 million red blood cells wanting to go down and 5,000 white blood cells trying to go up, imagine how difficult that is for that little white blood cell to make it to the upper layer, okay? Every time one white blood cell is down here and he wants to go up, there's 5,000, there's 1,000, sorry, Okay, there's 1,000 times more red blood cells that are coming down, trapping that little cell, the white blood cell, and that white blood cell never makes it to the top. And that's the reason why you see such a low yield of white blood cells typically on, on fixed angle centrifuges. Okay? And again, that's the cells. This is just you know, evidence just to show clinically kind of what you see. When you see this in a clinic, that's when you say, oh, oh boy, all my cells are jammed up back there. Now, our group... Um, you know, we've taken this very, very seriously because we wanted to optimize it for clinicians. And we were very fortunate to receive a big grant. Uh, it was $150,000 to do this stuff properly. There's never really been great research on this field. And what I mean by that is that, you know, when an implant company sells implants or bone grafts or other things, they're making a lot of money. It's very, very clear. And they have a lot of money then to invest in research and they sponsor a lot of, you know, good research projects. With platelet rich fibrin, you know, there's, it's not a, big field. There's not a lot of money for companies to make in that field. And when you're a clinician, when you have a centrifuge, every year you might buy one or two packs of tubes and some butterfly needles. And if you buy a pack of tubes for a hundred bucks, you know, the company might make $30 selling these tubes, right? So there's not really a lot of money in that field. And as a result, there's not a lot of money that's invested into research. 
we were very fortunate to get this grant, a big one from an independent organization, and that allowed us to literally look at many different protocols and figure out what's going on, and more importantly, how to optimize this. So what we did here was every single person that was enrolled, we took 24 tubes of blood, okay? And uh, when we take like 24 tubes of blood, always remember that a person, every week when they go to a blood bank, they can give 300 cc's of blood. Okay, they can do that weekly. So if we take 24 tubes, that's 240 mLs, you know, no big deal there. So we would take all these tubes and we'd spin out 100 G for three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, 12 minutes, 200 G, three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes, 12 minutes, 400 G, same thing, 700 G, 1000 G, 1200 G. And our goal was to figure out when you spin out these different protocols, what exactly is going on? How do you get these layers to separate properly? And when you look at this, 100G for 12 minutes and 1000G for three minutes, it looks identical, okay? There's no difference when you look at it. So you as a clinician, you can look at this and it looks identical. But when you actually quantify the cells in there, it's very, very different, okay? And that's the point that I always try and make um, with clinicians to try and optimize this as best as possible. Now, this is the graph from the paper, a very important one as well. When you look at it, it's obviously insanely confusing and probably nobody can understand uh, what's going on by looking at it very, very uh, uh, closely. But I'm going to explain it because this is how we develop the protocols. And I'm going to break it down so that people can understand. Here, uh, we just have the volume of plasma. So of course, the faster you spin, the longer you spin, the more liquid you have. Okay. These are the graphs of the amount of platelets. And I'm not going to talk about leukocytes. I'm just going to talk about platelets so that people can understand how these layers separate. Okay, so I'm going to make this very, very easy to understand. When we look at two protocols, here's 700G, here's 1000G. Okay? This is the total yield of platelets. So this is how many platelets are going into the upper platelet-rich fibrin layer over time. So after three minutes, I got about 50% of my, my cells there. After five minutes more, after eight minutes the most, and then you know, pretty consistent. If you have reached your peak yield, okay, like with this 1000G, if you keep spinning, and you keep going faster and faster, you then enter a zone where you, the cells will actually start going in the bottom layer. And so you can actually decrease your yield if you spin too fast. And it's one of the reasons why I always say there's a sweet spot, okay? Now look at the concentration. Concentration is the opposite. Concentration is very high early and it goes down with time, okay? So let's understand this very simply. When I start spinning in a centrifuge, okay? Let's say I spin for three minutes. I only have a small amount of liquid. Okay, so in that small amount of liquid, I have about 50% of my cells, but because the yield here, the yield is 50%, but the concentration is high. The volume is small, so there's a lot of cells there that are concentrated. That's what I would typically use for liquid platelet fibrin. It's more concentrated. If I keep spinning, what happens? Well, I might get more platelets that are going up, so the yield goes higher, but the problem is the volume increases, and now my concentration of platelets actually goes down. Okay, so there's always that ratio. Okay, I, I spin for a short amount of time, small volume, more concentrated. The more I spin, the bigger the separation. Okay, the more cells we'll actually have in there, but it's less concentrated. Higher yield, but lower concentration. Now, one thing that we found in this paper, uh, and this is very important for clinicians, when we spun too slow, 100, 100 G in this case here, on a horizontal, and this is actually faster than the 60 G that's uh, produced on the IPRF protocols, look at the amount of yield, okay? When I spin at 100 G force, which is typically around 1000 RPM, I'm not able to concentrate or collect a lot of my cells in this upper layer. And the concentration, of course, is also low. Okay? And the reason why we did this experiment this way here was we just simply showed there is a way that you spin so slow that you both have a low yield and you have a low concentration. And that's what happens typically with the IPRF protocols. Okay, Now, when we look at another one, 200G, now we're going a little bit faster. Now, over time, we get higher yield. So we know this, right? As we spin longer and longer, more and more platelets go into the upper layer. But of course, there's a difference in the concentration and where we find the highest concentration is around five minutes okay we have a small volume very highly concentrated and then if you keep going you get more volume but the concentration goes down this right here is the protocol that we use for liquid platelet rich fibrin okay out of all of them it's the one that's most concentrated we don't go super slow because when you go super slow too slow 
you actually don't get the right amount of, of uh, the right concentration. And like I said, it makes a big difference. The difference between this and this is about three times higher, okay, three times more cells, just by the protocol. So when you go back, you'll see the paper. It's a little bit confusing when you see the full graphs because that's the way that researchers want it all presented on the, on the same figure. But when you break it down, you can start to understand, okay? What we've done, what I just showed you was that's the 300G protocol, and that's the protocol that we use for liquid platelet-rich fibrin that's more optimized. The solid pure F1 is one that has more even distribution of cells, and that's produced at 700G for eight minutes from the previous paper. I want to talk about uh, this C pure F as well now, and that's the way to actually concentrate liquid platelet-rich fibrin in its most concentrated form, and it's based on the studies that we've done in 2020, so they're very, very new. Okay, when it comes to horizontal centrifuges, I always tell people the following. You know, you're going to hear a lot of commercial nonsense uh, with respect to this. It's very, very straightforward. Um, you can go online to a website, and I highly recommend people do this. Just go on Google and type in fixed angle versus horizontal centrifugation, and you're going to get a lot of info coming because horizontal centrifuge has been around for years and years and years. We did not invent it by any means. We just use it for the production of platelet fiber and to further optimize it. Online, you can find all kinds of info that explains exactly why you used a horizontal and exactly why you use a fixed angle centrifuge. When you read this, swing out rotor, so also known as the, the swinging buckets, okay? This rotor is particularly useful when samples are to be resolved in density gradients. The longer path length permits better separation of individual particle types from a mixture. However, this rotor is particularly inefficient for pelleting, okay? So when you use and you go online and you read about this stuff, Okay, the horizontal rotor is better at resolving based on density gradient. That's what we're doing with cells. We're separating based on density. What is pelleting? Okay, oh, let me go back here. Pelleting is this right here. When we're in a lab, and let's say I have a liquid and there's a lot of cells in this liquid. Let's say I got a lot of stem cells here, and I want to concentrate these stem cells in this liquid. I spin in a fixed angle centrifuge and I pellet my cells. What that means is that on a fixed angle centrifuge, the cells, they all go down to the bottom. And then what I do is I remove the liquid, and then I got all my stem cells that are pelleted at the bottom. That's called pelleting, okay? If you do pelleting in a horizontal centrifuge, you can still do it. But the disadvantage is that if this is a tube and this is the liquid, all of these cells that are here actually have to travel all the way down to the bottom, and then they get pelleted there. So it takes a long time to go from here all the way there. Whereas when you're on a fixed angle, if your cells are at the top here, they just go boom very quickly and then slide down to the bottom. And that's where you collect all your cells at the bottom of the tube here, and that's called pelleting. That is the reason why fixed angle centrifuges are invented. That's the role and, and where they're useful, okay? Not for separating based on density. When you use one of these centrifuges here for this purpose, this is what you get, okay? And that's what you see here, all the cells that are clumping up in the back there and also at the bottom of the tube. So again, one of the reasons why we don't recommend uh, using that. Another thing interesting, when I was actually going through uh, and looking at the differences and reading online just on regular you know, web pages, one thing that I read which was so interesting, and it was on the Drucker Diagnostics webpage, they said larger radius, higher RCF, shorter spin time. Tube centrifuge and a horizontal centrifuge experience a larger radius, resulting in a higher RCF and more efficient forces. Higher G-force produce better seal with the tube wall due to gel packing. The time required for complete centrifugation is only two-thirds of the time required in a fixed angled centrifuge. And right below that on the website, they show this. They say, if you go fixed angle, it'll take you 15 minutes to do this job. If you go horizontal, it'll take you 10 minutes. And I looked at that and I said, well, that's actually a huge advantage for platelet-rich fibrin because we're trying to separate these layers before the clot actually forms, right? The problem with platelet-rich fibrin versus PRP is you have to separate these layers before you know that clot actually forms. So if you have a device now that's horizontal and you can accomplish your layer separation in two-thirds of time, of course, there's a big advantage there. And you can separate faster and more efficiently, okay? And of course, gradient centrifugation definitely requires a swing-out bucket. This is for on Eppendorf's website. Now, okay, what is CPRF and, and what did we do and how did we invent this? And it's uh, very logical. It's the only the third protocol that you need. And we use it now for more than a year. And of course, uh, mainly used in facial aesthetics with our doctors, knee injections, hair injections, etc. But I want to explain what's going on here. This right here is the IPRF spin cycles. And you see there's very little layer separation. So all that's basically happening is plasma will be created, but there's not a huge amount of cell accumulation. 
okay? This right here is the LPRF protocol, and here we see all the cells are getting jammed right to this middle layer, and it's very concentrated here. So what we said was, you know, why would we take the one cc of IPRF, which has, you know, maybe a two, three-fold increase in, in platelets, why don't we instead, we know that following the LPRF protocols now, all this top layer is basically nonsense, it's garbage, got nothing in it, but all the cells are right here, and this is way more concentrated. So let's just grab a syringe and we'll go in there and we'll just take out the one cc layer right in the middle there, okay? And that was proposed as being the concentrated platelet-rich fibrin. And this right here, like I said, if you really want to concentrate PRF for different procedures, this is the way to do it, okay? And um, it was funny, I was kind of talking about PRP and looking at old, old uh, work that was done with in the PRP field. And uh, I remember being at the conference of Dr. Uh, Arun Garg and listening to the conference, his symposium every year is a good one to attend for those that are big into PRP. A lot of good info there. And I remember Dr. Rosie was showing, you know, the way that he separates layers with PRP. And I said, you know, that makes perfect sense. And one of the reasons why they have such a good yield of, uh, of platelets when they do it that way there. Now, of course, they use anticoagulants, but they actually get better concentrations. What we were trying to do here was kind of take the concepts that they had developed for many years ago. And sometimes you go back and read these old papers and you can learn a lot even, even for myself. Like I said, nobody has all the answers and good to, to learn as much as you can from other people. The concept was let's go in there and let's grab this layer, okay? And what we did was like our previous paper where we were doing you know one cc at a time. Now what we did was we said, I want to figure out exactly where these cells are. So instead of dividing one cc at a time, I did 0.1 cc layers, okay, 100 microliters. Boom, 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 all the way there, and three layers into the red, because of course there are some cells in that red layer, and we compared that to the standard IPRF protocols, okay? And the two questions were, you know, how thick is that buffy coat? And by thick, I mean, is it 0.1 mLs? Is it 0.3? Is it 0.5? Is it, is it one mL? We wanna figure out where the cells are actually living. And then more importantly, how many more times concentrated can we make this one compared to the standard IPRF protocols? And so we did the work. Um, this was published last year. Now we have a new paper coming out, um, which is gonna discuss how much more potent it is on cell activity in, in animal models. But in any event, when you spin this way here, you go from, you know, let's say close to 200,000 platelets up to four or 500. So you get about a two-fold increase, two to three-fold increase in platelets and a little fold increase into leukocytes. And like I said, most of these leukocytes are found right at the buffy coat layer. So make sure you go right to the red layer. But again, a two-fold from 200 to about four, five, 600 increase. When we did it the other way with the LPRF and we were doing layer by layer, again, we saw almost no cells there, but then within about two layers, three layers of thickness, that's where all the cells were located. And they were going from 200 to about six, 7,000, okay? So it was like a dramatic uh, increase in the concentration of all the cells that are found there. And that's what that protocol is. So then what we did was we said, okay, there's the liquid PRF, the IPRF. This is if you grab 0 0.5 cc's, okay? of that concentrated portion, you get about a 500% increase of leukocytes. And if you go even more concentrated, it'll be even higher, okay? And with the platelets, like I said, you can get up to 1,700% increase when compared to two to three-fold increase with IPRF. That's the way that our medical doctors today are separating out their layers, okay? When they do facial injections, knee injections, etc., that's the better way to do it. And the advantage of it as well is that, you know, if you wanted to have more volume, all you need to do is take a little bit more volume. So for instance, if I wanted one cc of this CPRF here, 0 0.5, I could either grab two tubes, which would be more logical, or I could grab this one tube and just take one cc, and the concentration when we have 1,100 platelets would be decreased in half, so it'd still be six, 700% um, around there, and you can vary the concentration. So I think a lot of work still needs to be done in this space here, but it's one that's quite relative for, uh, for uh, clinicians. Be skip over this okay and we've done a lot of these cell studies now just comparing the two this one here has been recently accepted again now we figured out you know the problem that we had in 2016 and why IPRF wasn't working as well you know now we figured out why that was and how to actually optimize this a little bit further now tubes big amount of research here on tubes as well and this is going to be uh, one thing that I'll finish up with very quickly the tubes like I said matter a huge amount and um, We've done a lot of research over the last year and a half, I would say, on trying to optimize the tubes further. And this one video that I'm gonna show here was one that was kind of an eye-opener for us. And uh, what we were doing in some of these studies was 
we were trying to figure out how long it took to actually fill these tubes up with blood. Okay. And we were drawing them from, from patients and saying, you know, this tube takes 15 seconds, this one takes 20 seconds, this one takes 25 seconds. Essentially, what we're trying to do is get the companies to improve the vacuum because we knew we had 90 seconds. So if we can have a better vacuum seal or better vacuum in the tubes, we can fill these up a little bit faster. And so we were testing them and, and testing them on, on patients as well. And while we were doing this test, we were just using a water bowl. Okay. And expected when you fill up these tubes with water you should expect that of course it stays clear right these tubes are supposed to be chemical and additive free and one of the things that we found so again those are the the liquid platelet rich fibrin tubes that are used by interspin one of the things that was so shocking for our group was that we had done all this research of course with the aprf tubes which you know over the years have, have done very very well and a more recent batch of these tubes when they were being filled up with water um, you'll see what happens here is there was actual chemical additives in here. So when we were taking these tubes here out, okay, and we filled them up with water, it was very, very shocking to see that, you know, we started getting some foam in here and we were thinking to ourselves like, what the heck is that, right? Um, and of course, since then we've quantified what it is and, and the silicone inside. And I know in Switzerland, like I said, they're doing more research to try and figure out exactly what's occurring in these tubes and, and why that is. But me as an educator, I was teaching a lot of people to use these tubes. Um, and unfortunately, like I said, it backfired on me because one year to the next, the company manufacturers changed the actual composition of these tubes to have chemicals inside. And uh, a lot of clinicians actually reported more failures as a result of that, okay? And just to make the you know obvious, it was one thing that I learned actually when I was in, uh, in Germany with Shalem Ganazzi. We had a, a huge amount of different tubes. So the same company, APRF tubes all the way from 2012, 2013, all the way up to 2019. And you can see here, this is a tube that's from 2017. So it's an older one. And I actually got this one here from my lab. So when I was doing the older research, we were using uh, these APRF tubes. And you'll see these ones here are just whole glass. Okay, They're whole glass, they work very well, and they clotted well. And uh, like I said, some of the companies, it, it really opened our eyes to, well, we're starting to learn that clotting matters a lot by the tubes. And now we're also starting to learn there's chemicals in some of these tubes. And what are these chemicals potentially doing to cells, uh, et cetera. And like I said, I've seen many, many posts on this online, uh, and not to create any more conflict or anything with other people, but a lot of people were posting on this and saying, you know, we've had increased pain, inflammation, et cetera. From a research side of things, um, give a lot of credit to Dr. Kwasi's group because what he showed in his study was, he did a really interesting study, this was published in 2019, where he was spinning in different types of tubes, and then whatever was coming off the walls, it was going into platelet-rich fibrin. He said, I'm gonna take that PRF membrane, I'm gonna put it down on a little Petri dish, I'm gonna enzymatically digest the entire fibrin, everything's gone, and the only thing that's left over is whatever's coming off the wall. Okay, and so in this paper, it was titled Evidence for Contamination of Silica Microparticles in Advanced Platelet-Rich Fibrin Matrix Prepared Using Silica Coated Plastic Tubes. He found that this is what was actually being left over in these actual fibrin clots, and that's basically what you're putting back into the patient if you're using some of these tubes types. Okay, so again, you know, we've done a lot of work since then to further optimize yeah, this. I, uh, I have this video here as well that's quite nice, and these are all red top tubes. Every one of these red top tubes is very different, okay? They all look the same, but actually some of them are made purposely by engineers that make, look at the color, just the color themselves are different, okay? There's different colors, different hydrophilicities. We're explaining to engineers, we're saying, look, I gotta make a hydrophilic surface, you know? I need it to be more hydrophilic, that way there are clots faster. And they were sending me a bunch of tubes about a year and a half ago that I made this, and we were doing a lot of testing. And I did this work with uh, Professor Zhang out in, in uh, China. And to illustrate this point, like I said, I took APRF tubes here, I took two intraspin tubes, and I took two of the newly developed glass tubes. And I had a colleague that basically just drew my blood, again, in a random order, so they drew six tubes, we took the six tubes, and you can see there, there they are, six different kinds. They're all getting drawn up, okay? And so after we draw them, one, two, three, four, five, six. Sorry, the video is going very fast and probably showing very poorly, but I just want to get to the point that's important here. After the eight-minute spin cycle, I just show the water test here, okay? I'm going to put the video back on here, okay? So usually, of course, after the spin cycle, it's 
So take a look at this. This is the plain glass tube, okay? After the spin cycle. And do you open it? Nope, uh, eight minutes. Okay, that's because- okay, And I was actually showing a, a clinician here and she was amazed because she said, wow, well, you didn't even pop the lid. You didn't have to wait anything. I said, no. This tube is very hydrophilic. It's a plain glass tube. There's no chemical additives inside this. And after the eight minute spin cycle, like I said, you take it, you flip it upside down. Okay, and that was really a big technological advancement. Now these tubes are not more expensive. You know, there's nothing different about them. They're just produced in a certain way to make the glass a little bit more hydrophilic. Look at the intraspin tube here. Look at this. Same person's blood, it's my blood, spun at the same time, random order, and look at that. Okay, falling apart right away. Okay, it's a smaller clot. It's not, as dense, it's not as dense, and on top of that, like I said, it's got a lot of the little silica microparticles in the, in the PureF membranes, okay? Here's another example of the glass tube. So question to colleagues, you know, why would you ever use a tube that would have chemicals inside of it when you get a great clot that's formed with plain glass, right? It doesn't make any sense. Same price, everything's, why would you ever use chemical additives in these tubes? And it's something that I think, and I've talked to a lot of people about trying to improve that field dramatically. And one colleague actually, uh, Dr. Tunali out in Turkey, I spoke to him uh, yesterday, you know, he's done a lot of work with titanium even, where they use titanium, which is a hydrophilic material, and can get better clotting if there's incorporation of titanium. Um, and uh, I think, you know, in the coming years, you'll see a lot of work with respect to these tubes. Now, when I made that video and showed it, you know, a lot of people started doing the same thing. They were just flipping the tubes upside down because they'd never seen that before. And you see here, when you look at this, I can see right here, this was spun on a fixed angle centrifuge. I can see right away. This one horizontal, right? Horizontal. So you can see who's spinning on what systems. And now, you know, the knowledge is slowly improving. And I've gotten a lot of nice feedback from colleagues because, of course, it was our group that developed these. Um, here's one. I got to admit, these tubes are a game changer, incredible results compared to the previous, uh, the obviously inferior tubes I was using. Thanks, Rick Meyer, for the opportunity to use these. Okay, and these are even some educators that you know educate with uh, on platelet-rich fibrin, and uh, they would give me comments. I send them some tubes. I said, just try these because it's a big difference. And uh, Rick, we finally tried your tubes. What a difference. The clots were huge, so much so that there was my beautiful assistants could turn the tubes upside down. Way to go, Dr. Myron. Okay, and so, you know, we've put this in papers, of course, and, and published on this, just showing how much bigger the tubes are with less chemicals. And, you know, we've done the work for that side. Um, you know, the group in Japan has really hammered down on anybody putting chemicals inside tubes. And if you ever want to see somebody lecture on this topic, uh, Dr. Kwasi, like I said, has done a lot of nice studies on, on this topic and he's the one that showed what's going on inside the fibrin clots. You know, it's something to be aware of, okay? And he actually showed that the silica, of course, is getting incorporated into these cells and actually causing them to, you know, die basically. So he's shown uh, apoptosis in these cells. So, you know, I not trying to cause conflict or anything of that kind, but just if you're gonna use platelet-rich fibrin, take a tube, and it doesn't matter where you live in the world, um, do the water test, it's very easy. You can literally pop the lid, put a little bit of water, shake it up, okay? And if you see some foam that's foaming up, probably you got some chemicals. Try and find, ideally, uh, very hydrophilic, chemical-free glass tubes is what I recommend. Now the last thing um, that I'm just gonna share and then we're gonna go to questions and uh, I'll give the, the coupon code for those that join late where they can join our online platform which has eight modules. You guys can get access to the whole thing. It's got all the papers and videos and other things that you can have. Um, the development of the BioHeat which was something that was more recent and uh, was something that we did with different colleagues from Italy as well as from uh, Brazil. So Ezio Gano has done some work with this, a nice animal study that I'll show, uh, as well as Carlos Morau, who's done some studies as well on this topic. And the concept was you take blood, you spin it, and you got to use a different protocol. So we use the CPRF protocols. The upper layer can actually be heated. And why do we go through the trouble of doing this? It's very simple. PRF only lasts two to three weeks when you heat it it will last four to six months, okay? And so you're really able to extend the working properties of, of platelet-rich fibrin. And of course, this field took off a lot in aesthetic medicine, so facial aesthetics, that was a game changer, because now you had a natural biological filler that could be made very cheaply, um, as well as we started using it in dentistry, and I'll show you what we did in, in burn. So spin fast, upper platelet pore layer, the albumin goes into the heater, the bioheat machine, you heat it up for 10 minutes, you then remix it with the very rich 
CPRF layer and the buffy coat, mix them together and you can create what's called alb for albumin PRF, so alb PRF, and that's what it looks like. Totally different than standard platelet-rich fibrin. And you can make membranes just the same. And this was a paper that was just recently submitted where this animal here has received PRF on one side, okay, and there's the alb PRF on the other side. And this animal, because it's got a faster metabolic rate, this is representative of months after it's been implanted. And you can see here, it's still there, okay? And what's cool about that is now you can imagine placing something like this into somebody's lips as a facial filler or uh, you know, using it as a membrane in dentistry and, and other procedures. Like I said, really a lot of uh, possibility here. And so the protocol, like I said, you take it out, the liquid, you put it in the heating device for 10 minutes, and then uh, this is what it looks like. So this is the liquid platelet-rich fibrin that you're used to. Here's the albumin gel that's been heated, so it changes. Now, you cannot mix this heated portion with the liquid portion. And the reason why is because this is really hot. That's, and, and if you mix it with living cells, it'll kill the cells, so you gotta cool it. And that's where that little biocool device that I'll show a little bit later comes in handy. And after you mix it, the way it's done is using this female-female uh, syringe, so it's a lure lock syringe. And it's very straightforward. You just pass it back and forth 10 times. This is done here in Bern, Switzerland, where we would just very easily, you know, pass the liquid back and forth a few times. And we'll get a nice even distribution of the albumin component, which will last four to six months. And we replace in all the cells to help with, you know, growth factor delivery, etc. And that's what's being utilized for injections. Now, in August last year, when I was in Bern, Switzerland, uh, you know, we were working with this stuff. Notice the consistency here, it's thicker. What did we use this for? We said, why don't we use this for over top of titanium meshes? And that's what we started doing in, in the clinics with the, the big, uh, you know, maxillofacial surgeons, etc. To basically try and minimize, because we know titanium has a high rate of exposure. And uh, if you can use this natural material that's going to last four to six months and place it over top, you know, we're doing a, a case series today, just looking at percentages uh, with respect to optimizing and trying to reduce titanium mesh exposure. When this is created, and again, you know, you make this stuff for only a few bucks when you have the equipment, it's only about four tubes and uh, very easy to produce. You can then use this bioheat device to do exactly the following, okay? Um, since then, there's been creation of the trays, and the trays are basically just custom sizes for different procedures. So if you want a 30 by 40 collagen membrane, you can make it there. Uh, these are for extraction sockets. This is for people doing the tunneling, okay? The tunneling techniques, so, uh, you know, Dr. Tuttle or Dr. Alum has done a lot of work in that field too. You can make a big one, and then you can pass the big one through the tunnel. Um, in gingival grafting procedures. So a lot of different applications, a lot of people doing research right now. I'm not gonna go through the protocol again. For those that want it, you can go to the online platform and look at it there. But look at these results, okay? Look at, you know, this right here. Look at, the, I mean, it's shocking. It's a game changer. This was a case that, you know, we had treated between three different colleagues. And, uh, you know, we've seen her about two weeks ago where originally, look at her marionette lines, look at the wrinkles, you know, look at the texture of the skin. And this was done with platelet-rich fibrin with the bioheat. This was done with uh, microneedling with platelet-rich fibrin, which I'm not gonna get into, but, and as well as with lasers. So of course I have to give a big component here is we use the Fotona laser system to help with, with this stuff. But everything done to this woman was 100% natural. There's 100% natural, there isn't a single chemical. There's no Botox, there's no fillers, there's nothing. 100% natural. And um, between the combination of using lasers and also using um, platelet-rich fibrin. I mean, you can really get a really nice outcome. And this, once you have the equipment, doesn't cost anything, you know? A couple PRF tubes, lasers already bought. I mean, very easy to do. And so this is work that I've been doing with Dr. Del Bacio, uh down in Naples. And if anybody wants to learn more, we have courses specific to that field uh, on the PRF EDU website. This was the last thing that I wanted to show. And what this is, is this right here, when you look at this, this is actually the extended PRF membrane. So that's the alb PRF on the outside and that sticky bone on the inside. And the way that we make this is we literally take the tray and we take the albumin gel, we put it at the bottom of the tray. So that goes on first, boom. We make our membrane that's gonna be extended four to six months. 
Then we take our allograft, for example, we sprinkle it on over top of that, and then we take standard liquid platelet-rich fibrin and we make our sticky bone. So this right here has the sticky bone right here, and it's got the outer membrane layer. So when we take this out of the tray after five minutes from clotting, we go to a ridge and you want to do a horizontal augmentation, you take this and path it right on the ridge. And you got the bone on bone, right? The yeah, sticky bone on the bone, and you got the outer uh, slower resorbing platelet-rich fibrin on the outside. So again, a lot of cool things there that we're doing um, there. This right here is just the biocool device, very simple. We did a lot of research with respect to trying to get the temperature control so the cells stay alive. And uh, all it is, is it's basically a little cooler and uh, you put the liquid platelet-rich fibrin in there and it'll extend the working properties of it by typically double, okay? So if you work, especially in the facial field and you're working with liquid platelet-rich fibrin, a lot of times these procedures, for example, if you do hair injections, will last, you know, 30, 40 minutes. And unfortunately, sometimes the liquid platelet-rich fibrin layer will, will clot. With this little device, it'll stay liquid. And, and uh, device is only 89 bucks, so it's very, very cheap in the United States. But it helps for those that want to extend the working properties of the liquid platelet-rich fibrin. Where this is important is in the bioheat. Okay, so if you get the bioheat, it's the whole kit. It comes with one of these biocool devices. And as a result, when you heat up the albumin gel, instead of just waiting around because the liquid platelet-rich fibrin will clot, you put it in the biocool, you cool it, and then you can mix it very quickly. Okay, so a lot of people have not seen that before. So again, those are the three protocols. Like I said, I wanted to go through all three just to kind of summarize, you know, all the advancement that we've made in the field. And, um, you know, again, just to recap very quickly, with the liquid platelet fibrin, we increase the concentration of platelets and leukocytes in these upper layers. This is what's typically standard for IPRF, but this is a little bit superior now because we realize that, you know, the standard original IPRF were too slow. And we went over some of that data. Okay, we, we use this for mixing with bone grafts, injecting, microneedling, endo people use it, uh, perio people use this as well. Um, the solid PRF is what's most commonly used in dentistry, and this is one that gives a nice even distribution of platelets and leukocytes in the upper layers. And this has a lot of applications, as you know, this is the one that's most commonly utilized in dentistry. And again, very important to select the right uh, tubes, okay, I cannot stress that enough. And then lastly, the CPRF one was the one that was more recently developed. And this was, you know, faster protocol, slamming all the cells right in the buffy coat zone, and then purposely going right to that zone and taking out those cells right in that zone. And that's the one that we use for the bioheat, so for facial fillers and making these membranes, etc. Okay, so those are the three. And like I said, I hope the video is summarized that as best that I could, and you can always go back and, and listen to it later and have access Hello, to the Hello, my name is Dr. Richard Myron, and I'm very happy to announce our new online. Here, I'm just gonna quickly uh, back up here just so that I can explain what I'm doing here. For those that joined a little bit later, um, we made a big online platform, so it's got nine modules where I teach people how to do Pure F. This is just a short little video. This covers everything, how to use it for sinus grafting, bone grafting, etc. cetera. Um, it's available at www.puref-edu.com. Um, I usually charge 595 for the program, and uh, as a result of everything going on with COVID, you know, I wanted to do something nice in particular for Canadians. And so if you go to the website and you type in the code coupon free COVID, it'll give you free access to this program, okay? And I wanted to do it just to allow people to try and, you know, use this time during this COVID time to educate yourself. So this is just a small little one minute video of what it is, but, you know, screenshot or write down the fact that you can use the coupon, coupon code free COVID. Um, and then you'll get access to that. So that wraps up everything. Of course, uh, it's a little bit longer than an hour here that I've been on, but I really wanted to cover the topic as best that I could. Again, my email address here is rick at themyronlab.com. So if people have uh, any questions, you can get a hold of me this way here. Again, I have to thank uh, Dr. Mark Bashara without question for uh, inviting me today. It's been a real pleasure to hang out with some Canadian colleagues, even though it's online. And uh, we have a course that was designed to be in June up on his website. We'll all actually be in Canada, uh, in Toronto with him. I hope we can still do it. I'm not sure if it'll run, but if not, we'll do it at a later time date. And uh, it's available on the Canadian Implant Dentistry Network on the website. 
and uh, you'll learn how to do some of the bioheat stuff and we can talk about what we do in facial aesthetics and, and how we make the membranes and the bioheat and use the biocool. So I hope we have the opportunity, both Mark and I, to see you sometime in the future. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and disconnect right now, but I'll answer some questions if there was any comments that were made um, and happy to receive emails and answer you guys there. So again, thank you very much for your attention.